Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar. We appreciate you joining us today. Uh, we'll just take a few seconds and let everybody join the room here in a second. Uh, today's webinar is on disaster recovery, uh, how to get ready to prepare your business for uh, any event eventuality. Um, just seeing a few people jump in here. We do have the chat open, so feel free to chat uh, there on the side. Uh, feel free to ask questions as we go. We will have time for question and answer at the end, uh, but feel free to ask your questions as we're going along in the chat. Uh, we will also have a recording of this webinar available after the fact. We will send that out to all of you and make it available on our website. So and be, feel free to send that out to any colleagues you think would find this useful. Um, as people filter in, I'll go ahead and introduce our presenter today. It's James Fair, who is our Senior Vice President of Technical Operations at Executech. Uh, James has been at Executech for over seven years now and uh, has an extensive background in IT, done everything from help desk to now uh, leadership. Um, James is kind of our go-to expert on all things IT, whether it's cybersecurity or networking or, or talking about disaster recovery today. Uh, we're glad that James could be joining us. Uh, welcome, James, and thank you. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate the intro. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I suspect a lot of us are spending some time thinking about disaster recovery, you know, right about now. Um, so I'd like to take some time today, uh, maybe break it down into smaller pieces, uh, more manageable parts, hopefully. Uh, for many organizations, it seems like it's a huge task, pretty a pretty daunting task, right? Um, so my intention is to provide some understanding around disaster recovery, uh, know how to speak to it, understand it a bit more, uh, how the other how the industry looks at it in terms of terms, and perhaps even make it a little less daunting for everyone. So that's the plan. Um, as Gary mentioned, I'll go ahead and drop my webcam here. Ba -ba -ba. As Gary mentioned, my name is James Fair. Uh, I have been in IT for, oh my goodness, nearly three decades now. Um, so I'll just do this real quick for you guys, just so you know, I'm, I do know what I'm talking about here. Uh, I have held positions that Gary mentioned, everything from entry level tech all the way up to my current position and everything in between. So I have uh, a, a perspective I can offer from various functions along the IT uh, ladder. Um, I've personally lived and experienced much of what we're gonna talk about today. And I also have a passion for wanting to keep people safe. Uh, I've taken up pursuits around cybersecurity, compliance, and then how to technologically survive, right? Particularly events uh, that may have taken down other organizations in the past. What can we learn from them? How do we avoid that happening uh, to anybody else in the future? So, all right, let's go ahead and get rolling. So uh, quick agenda, I don't wanna bore you with this one. Um, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to define DR a little bit. We're going to talk about some of the disasters we may expect. Uh, we're going to cover specifically around ransomware. It's a big deal these days. Some planning and recovery. We're going to look at costs. I'm not going to give you hard numbers, but I'm going to give you an idea of, of what will determine costs and then how we can, what we can do to keep those costs down. Uh, first steps, we're going to talk quickly about replication and backups. Um, some, some real brief recommended protection. We'll talk about a recovery plan. We're going to talk about the systems affected. Um, and then restoration rebuilding. How do we get out of it once we're in that stage? And then maybe talk about some expectations in the near future. So uh, as Gary mentioned, we will be taking questions at the end. Feel free to put them in the chat. Um, if, if it's quick, maybe it's something we do along the way, they'll let me know. Uh, I have been kind enough to be uh, have these folks with me here helping. So uh, by all means, send your questions in and we will uh, answer them at the end during a Q&A session. Um, Uh, oh yeah, last thing, I am working from home. Uh, so I'm working on a better studio for today. I do apologize if you have any background noise. Uh, I'm sure we're all experiencing that challenge. I will definitely work to improve that, so. Okay, so what does uh, disaster recovery mean from an IT perspective? And um, for us, I'm defining disaster recovery as having secondary technology plans, procedures, and trained personnel uh, already in place and ready to respond to any potential uh, future work stopping event. And we certainly hope it never happens. Um, and until recently, that kind of meant that we, had to, how do we work not at the office, right? Um, I should point out that as we talk, some of this is going to feel like I'm talking about us now and I am. 
Uh, that's because we we are mid disaster. And and the way I confirm this is I look and I say, uh, okay, uh, what's this? What's the most common solution when we can't work at the office? And it's work from home, which is what we're all doing right now. So I'll, I'll talk some about that. Um, some of this was positioned, hopefully, when this uh, current crisis is over, and obviously a little bit about before, but we'll talk some about during, too. All right, so some common disasters, right? Um, I added internet outage on here. It wasn't on there before. I don't know that we would consider it necessarily a disaster, but it, it is a real thing. It's something we experience, uh, I wouldn't say frequently, but it's certainly not uncommon and it is a work stoppage event so it should be on your plan how, how do we deal with it how do we deal with it in the event we do not have internet um and i don't know about you guys but uh, internet outage at my house right now pretty big deal <laughs> whole bunch of people come up uh come up from downstairs and, and my phone blows up suddenly and um yeah i'm a little concerned about a mutiny if netflix goes down here but um so we certainly hope things don't break um but we have a tendency to, to get comfortable about things when they don't. So I want to encourage you folks to look at some of these things like hardware failure. Just because your server hasn't had an issue in three or four or five years doesn't mean it's not going to. And all of us have a tendency to go, oh, it's been running for a while now. It will certainly continue to do so. And I would, I would encourage you to take the opposite approach. If your hardware has been running for multiple years, perhaps it's time to look at it and make sure you're getting ahead of that. There, there is an expense to it, obviously, um, but if we can proactively replace the components that may fail, we may uh, reduce the chances of an unexpected failure or an unexpected outage. Software corruption, um, operating systems, the hardware you run on, these were all created by humans, right? And the code uh, is written by humans and humans make mistakes. So, I, you know, we all get annoyed about our computers when they crash or they require restarting. Uh, but if I think about, you know, the the motherboard that was created and written and the code was written by humans and the processor also by humans and they put that into a you know a windows platform written by humans and it's running my my uh, word program or my demo uh, demo all of these were written by different groups of different human beings all of them subject to human error so sometimes i'm kind of amazed that we all do can run for weeks and weeks without a crash um, but it is a, it is a possibility software corruption exists and the ransomware um, this unfortunately has been really prevalent the last couple of years and it doesn't seem to be slowing down. In fact, it seems to be speeding up. So we're gonna cover ransomware a little bit. Um, power outages, obviously this is a real thing. If power, go power goes out, what do you do? Um, we can we typically put battery backup units in place as a temporary stopgap. Uh, you can do more, more permanent or more uh, failover type solutions with a generator, that's certainly an option. <coughs> Excuse me, or you just send people home or elsewhere, right? That's the other option. And then natural disasters. Um, I'm leaving the elephant on the room with the current crisis. Uh, for those in Salt Lake, we, we experienced an earthquake. Um, so that was a natural disaster where, and it, fortunately we were fairly blessed that it, the impact was minimal um, compared to others, but there were places downtown that simply could not house, house employees. So what do you do during those events? And then lastly, theft is a real thing. And I want to encourage everyone to, uh, I, I, you know, this, these aren't fun subjects to think about, but we do need to take that into consideration. If a break-in were to occur, can we can we respond to it? Can we re can we get back from it? Can we recover from it? Uh, we have had uh, companies in the past who would uh, we've seen it. For instance, they were doing backups locally; they weren't doing cloud-based backups. And a theft occurred. Someone stole their server, stole their workstations, and stole their backup tapes, and backup drives rather, and they had nothing. So I would encourage you to, to look and say, all right, if a theft really happened and all of this went, um, how do we recover from that? Okay, enough of the fun stuff. Um, here's some scary numbers just for a second. Uh, unfortunately, 40% of businesses close after suffering a disaster. Most folks just aren't prepared, aren't geared up and ready to deal with that. 75% um, of businesses polled do not have a disaster recovery plan of any kind. So I would encourage you, please take a little bit of time. I know we've all been kind of doing this, you know, already, but... Uh, try to get ahead of it if you can, have a plan in place and that everyone knows to do. So it's just a matter of pulling the trigger rather than trying to invent the wheel at the time of the crisis. 52% um, of businesses say it would take at least three months to recover from a disaster. And this seems like a really big number, uh, but I, I've experienced this personally. I, I, I'm going to share some stories I told you along the way. Uh, I had a client downtown, law firm. They had like 12 terabytes of storage and they were using a, uh, one of the inexpensive cloud-based solutions. 
and it was a backup. So, you know, I, I don't want to discount anything about the costs here. Um, but I will say that when we, when construction happened downtown and they had a catastrophic server failure and we had to replace the server and the drives, we went to restore that data. Well, downloading from the cloud, 12 terabytes of data over a reasonably slow internet connection takes a really, really long time. And there's the added impact that during that time, the internet was heavily used. used so internet uh, based functions were slower for that company. Uh, so we had to slow it down even further, right? During the day, eight to five, let's let's throttle that back. Uh, we had to go through a sequence of making sure we got the most important critical files first, pull those out, and then go get the next batch of more important files, do that three or four times, then start on all the rest of them while trying not to replace the existing ones you've already um, restored. So it's a challenge and, and one I want to encourage you to, to try to get ahead of as much as possible. And again, I hope uh, for all of our sakes and for yours, certainly, that it's never happens to you, but it's better to have a plan in place in case it does. Okay, ransomware. So ransomware is a pretty scary thing out there. Unfortunately, we've seen more and more cases of this. Um, I think one of our AV uh, vendors let us know that last year they were seeing as many as 400,000 variants of malware um, every day. And these aren't necessarily like new strains or someone wrote a new program, but someone took an existing malware and changed it a little bit to try to try to get past our security levels. Um, and then a very scary number is that 40% of ransomware victims pay. Uh, I'm not sure where this stat came from, but any amount of pay is more than we want to. You know, we don't want to pay the attackers for attacking us. That's what it. That's what causes them to keep doing this. They're making money at it. So whenever possible, we we do not want to pay. We will put everything in place uh, to try to prevent that from happening. Okay. And and believe me, I've had plenty of conversations with customers about ransomware and about backups, and it's not a fun conversation to to ask someone, "Do you have backups?" No, I don't. Well. Here's the uncomfortable conversation. So um, on average, even though you may pay a ransom, it takes two days on average to restore that data. So uh, if you pay the ransomware, in most cases, uh, the attackers will give you a program that, that decrypts all that data, but that's a program that has to be run on every single file and every single machine that got encrypted. It's a long process, even if you have the decryption tool. So keep in mind, even during ransomware, you're going to be down for a couple of days. So um, all these are not attempts to scare you. They are certainly attempts to raise awareness and and they are some justification for costs, right? Well, if we know we're going to be down for a couple of days in the event this happens, then maybe we can justify some, some security expenditure from this. Um, and then again, here's a pretty scary stat. Uh, fortunately, my personal experience has not been this, um, but there are victims who uh, pay and they can't get their data back um, either because the machine was already cleaned off or something transpired or they were the attackers were lying but there are a certain percentage of people who just simply do not get back their data even after paying so take that with caution all right so disaster planning and recovery um, let's do a little exercise here uh, we've highlighted some of the challenges so let's talk about how we address this so the exercise I'd like I don't have to do this now but Something I'd like you to do perhaps after this call or today or, you know, keep it top of mind, please. At some point, run through this little exercise. Write down every single system you, your staff, your members, uh, fellow work uh, employees log into every day. Do you, do you, you know, you log into your computers, right? You, lo you probably check email. Some of you may have QuickBooks. Um, there are lots and lots of other systems. Everyone has their own unique ones. Write down every one of those systems and then put some thought into it and ask yourself, okay, which one of these is mission critical? Which one, which one could we not do without or which one could we do without the least amount of time? And then I encourage you to, to separate these systems in, into buckets. What's, what's critical, you know, mission critical, what's important or what's urgent and then what's important and then what's stuff that we can, yeah, if we get it back next month, that's fine. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, separate those out and that will give you an idea of where to start, okay, right? The mission critical points, that's where we want to begin. Um, all right, moving on to the next one. So let's talk about costs here for a sec. Costs are the biggest factor of this. As, as much as I would love to tell you that you, you can do this for free, that's probably unrealistic and, and, and not feasible. The truth is there's a cost to, to most technology and most technology solutions. We have to pay someone else to house our data, uh, you know, uh, anyway, there's a cost to it. And there are, a couple, there are really two big factors that go into this. And the, the first factor is how far back are you willing to go? So, 
you know, is, is last Saturday an acceptable re restoration? So if everything went down, if, if you lost everything and had to restore, is last weekend acceptable? Or does it have to be yesterday? Or does it, or does it have to be last hour? And this is a big factor, right? This determines um, the solution you're going to put in place for that particular group of systems, that, that mission critical one. How far, how long can we wait? And that's, uh, and then there's another one. The other factor is how long will it take us once we decide to recover? So we, we lose our data and we say, yes, let's go ahead and recover from last Saturday. What, how long is that restoration period? I, you know, I mentioned before it was like a month to restore 12 data bytes, of, 12 terabytes of data rather. Um, the industry refers to these as RTO and RPO. I didn't make these up. I wouldn't make you memorize these, these tech terms, except you're going to run across these in, in the industry. And if you, you use these words, uh, the people you speak to, the vendors will know, oh, this person knows what they're talking about. So uh, this is recovery point objective and recovery time objective. How long is it going to take? How far back can we go? And I would encourage you to, to think about it this way, right? This is how we're going to consider backups or any kind of recovery operation is, is how far can we go back and how long will it take us? And then that kind of determines everything else we put into place and costs. So as far as costs go, there are some things that we can certainly reduce, uh, we can do to reduce those costs. And those would be along those things, those lines we just talked about. So um, number one, of course, how, we, how do we prevent the disaster in the first place? As I mentioned, if we can justify some security expenditure from looking at the potential downtime, you know, what can we put in place? It's like an insurance policy. What's, what's worth, what's the low hanging fruit that isn't a great cost that we can put in place that gives us less likelihood of experiencing a disaster. Um, which one of these, which, which of these are cost effective? And, and look at that, right? Look at your lists, your, your groups on the mission critical ones. What will you put in place? And when you look at that and say, yep, this will solve it. Will this not, you know, make sure you're spending your money where it needs to go. Um, what, what can we do to speed up the recovery process? And, and the answer is a smaller footprint. The less data you have, the faster that recovery operation. So, uh, a lot of organizations we work with, they, they just keep everything forever. They don't, they're not really sure when to do it. I uh, haven't spent a whole lot of time at that. Uh, but uh, from a legal perspective, I'm not a lawyer, but I've spoken with lawyers and they will encourage you, delete that old data. If you have a, a seven year or an 11 year compliance requirement, delete the data older than that periodically. Run through once a year, once a quarter, whatever, and evaluate that old data and see if you really need to keep it if you don't get rid of it. Because number one, you don't. it's a smaller footprint. Your backups are, are faster. Um, should a legal event occur, you have much less data to search through. If you have data that's 12 year old, 12 year olds on your server and you get a subpoena, you have to look through that data legally. But if it's not there, then there's nothing to look through. So um, look at what you must back up, see if you can reduce that footprint. Um, see if there's other things we can do, reduce old data, that kind of thing. And then you wanna encourage streamlining the process. So well, what does that look like? That looks like preparing this ahead of time. So you've had conversations with the IT people, there are plans in place, and you can, you know, at some point, someone called them up and say, okay, we're gonna go. And everyone knows what that means, everyone knows what that looks like. That will reduce that amount of time even further. So first steps, first steps are backups, right? This is, this is the, I, I cannot begin to tell you how important backups are. Uh, in my line of work, they're, you can recover from just about everything if you have a backup. The, the theft, the floods. If we can get some hard, buy some new hardware, set it up, then we can recover from that backup. Backups are beyond critical, uh, particularly in the ransomware environment. I, I'm going to stress this a couple times throughout this throughout this uh, webinar. I apologize, but I it is super critical. Uh, again, I can't tell you how many ransomware conversations I have to say, do you have backups? And if they say no, then it's a whole different conversation. If they say yes, then we go, okay, well, how far back is it? Well, it's from Saturday. Great. Is is that acceptable to you? Then let's wipe everything out that the attacker is infected. We're going to put back your old data and we're going to go back to work and we're not going to pay those guys. Um, so uh, what else can I say about backups? As I mentioned, local backups are great in terms of um, speed. So if I need to restore that 12 data bytes from the cloud, it's going to take me a really long time. If I have those 12 terabytes sitting here locally on my heart on a couple hard drives next to my server, much, much, much faster. But there are the challenges to local backups, right? They are subject to theft and flood and fire and these other things. 
Um, so I, I really encourage both. It, it sounds like a little bit of redundancy, but when it comes to backups, there is, in my opinion, never enough redundancy. Uh, we want to have backups in the cloud because those are more difficult to touch by attackers and they typically do versions. So even if attacker overwrote your backup on the cloud with a uh, corrupted version, you can say, hey, backup people, I need to restore the previous one. It's typically an option you get. Um, local backups, most ransomware is looking for that stuff. They know it. They're on the watch for it. Every time security folks uh, implement some kind of IT solution to try to prevent this from happening, those folks try to figure out a way around it. It's this big cat and mouse game we're playing with them, unfortunately. Um, I, I can't say who's winning. Uh, ransomware is still happening, so it's a real thing. So backups locally for speed, backups cloud-based for redundancy and for off-site backups in case something happens to your site. And the last piece I'll say about this is a little more technical necessarily, but have a conversation with your IT people. Um, ransomware attackers these days are very insidious. They don't just encrypt, send you a, a, a program via email and encrypt your files. They try to get in, they try to change passwords, they try to prevent any recovery operation. So they're looking for any kind of backup product out there. They're figuring out ways to delete those backups. Uh, all of our servers have what's called volume shadow copy where it keeps previous versions. Those are automatically blown away by ransomware. Like anything they can do to prevent you from being able to recover, they're going to do. So backups need to be um, off-site and they need to be a separate set of credentials. So nowadays we're big into integrating things. We want one login and password to get us everywhere. And that's fantastic for ease of use and for employee operation for work, definitely. For security, I'm going to say no. When it comes to backups, at least, create a whole separate set of credentials that are locked away. No one can touch. No one knows about. I mean, they need to be accessible, of course, but um, make sure the attackers can't get to those. Those backups are your uh, final final play, right? So make sure you've got them. Okay, enough about that. Sorry. Um, replication. So replication is um, a little different from backup. Actually, I think I have a slide on this. Yeah, I do. So we're going to move on. Next slide, sorry. So backup uh, versus replication. So backing up my data, I'm gonna take all the files that are on my server and I'm gonna stick them somewhere, let's say on the cloud. Um, replication's a little different. Replication is I'm gonna take my server as it sits in the folder structure it is and the way it's running and the programs it's running, and I'm gonna replicate that somewhere else, uh, usually in the cloud. Uh, there's a couple of different products we'll talk about here coming up, but replicating is taking a snapshot of your server as it appears with the programs running and everything and creating a duplicate of that somewhere else. As you can imagine, this reduces the amount of time it takes to get back up and running. Um, you know, if, if your primary server goes down for power, theft, hardware failure, whatever, and you have a replication server, you are far more likely to be up very soon. You're gonna go tell everyone, okay, stop connecting to the server, we're down. We're gonna now connect, this is uh, more technical than I'm making it sound, of course, but um, we're gonna go now connect to this, to this uh, replication server instead. Um, so just be aware there's a big difference and a big difference in cost to go along with that. Talk about the different types of backups. There are really three primary different types of backups. I covered them. That's premise-based or your local backups, uh, cloud-based, talked about those. And there's a hybrid, both. All right, I think we covered this slide pretty well. I don't need to hammer on this one anymore. So um, two backups I recommend. Uh, I think we're talking about, sorry. I'm on the wrong slide. Backup. Here we go. Azure Backup and Acronis Cloud. These are two of the more common products that we use here at Executech. I, I don't care what product you use. As long as you can back up your stuff and keep it and keep it secure from attackers, use what you like. These are two that we have worked with and found to be uh, easy to work with. The price point is what is is uh, good for the value you get. Um, they're cloud-based, so you don't have to worry about local backups. Strongly encourage you to look at these two products if you're not. I think I skipped a slide somewhere. Hang on. Ah, okay, sorry, I did skip a slide. That went out of order here. Replication. Uh, the two types of replications I'm gonna talk about today are Azure Site Recovery and Acronis DR. Uh, again, I'm sure there are other products out there. And I'm sure there are other products that work well. These are two that, that I am personally familiar with. We at Execute Tech encourage people to use because we have um, 
tried, tested, and true with these folks. So Azure Site Recovery, or ASR as it's known, is a Microsoft product. Essentially, you're going to replicate your server as it stands right now to one of the Microsoft Azure servers. And then when you're, if for some reason uh, the organization goes down locally, then everyone switches and connects to the Azure server. Our Cronus DR, um, it's a similar type scenario. I don't know where Cronus stores their, their servers, but um, it's an ongoing replication or copy of your server the way it's running. And it, it's pretty slick. I've used this thing. If, if the Cronus disaster recovery utility detects that your server is no longer responding, it just kind of auto fails over. And as long as the network is still up in your local office, just and just the server that went down, everyone will switch and automatically connect to the new server. Um, there'll be just this delay. And most people didn't even know it happened sometimes. So uh, pretty cool product. Okay, let's get back on track, sorry. Okay, briefly, um, this isn't necessarily about disaster recovery, but I do want to touch on this product. I, I am not a Sophos employee. They do not pay me to say this, uh, but we at Executech and, and me personally, again, have been super impressed by this product called Intercept X. And, and again, there, may, there are probably other products out there that do the same thing. This is the one we are familiar with. In cases of ransomware, this thing so far, knock on wood, has stopped it cold. Um, and it's a little different from your traditional so most endpoint protection or server protection works off of a, a list, a signature list. Someone detects a bad program, the signature is then passed around to everybody else that's running that antivirus program and they block it from that point on. But it's a reactive approach, right? I get the, I get the, someone had to get that program first, figure out it was bad, then tell everybody else to stop doing that. So these folks got smart with this product and it's a behavioral based product. So rather than looking for signatures, it's looking at the way your computer is acting. If your computer suddenly starts encrypting files, well, the software is gonna go, that's a little odd. And it's gonna watch that process. And if it keeps encrypting files, it's gonna stop it. It's gonna, I don't know what you're doing and I'm not, I'm not even sure how to clean you off, but I'm gonna stop that process from happening. Then someone like myself, an IT consultant can go in and look and say, oh, that was legitimate. It was, you know, someone was encrypting their files or no, that was ransomware. Thank you for stopping it. And the idea is, as long as we're behavioral based, then any variant, any kind of ransomware, as long as it's encrypting files, as long as it does that behavior, should be something we can stop. Again, it's not going to clean, it's not going to prevent, but it should stop it from happening. And we have seen evidence of this work flawlessly. In fact, I've not seen it not work in cases of ransomware. Um, you can install it on your workstations to prevent them from getting infected. You put it on your server, particularly, it's super important on the server, right, where all the files are stored to prevent it from happening there as well. Um, and again, it does, it, it's behavioral based. We're going to see some of the files get encrypted before it goes into lockdown effect. Uh, but super effective product, strongly recommended. It goes on top of any uh, antivirus product you have currently, as I understand it. So strongly encouraged if you don't have this or a similar product, please look at anti-ransomware products. And until we change the way we do security, this is a, a real problem out there. And I see it way, way too, too often. All right. Oh, let's talk about a recovery plan. As I mentioned, the plan needs to include um, discovering your critical systems, right? Listing those out. What is critical? What is mission critical? What can wait a week? What can wait a month? Um, and then identify and assign roles to that. Okay, you're gonna be, should something go wrong, the server goes down, you, madam, you, sir, whatever, you are in charge of this particular piece of software and or you IT group. When this server goes down, this is the process. Make sure you're back up, contact these people, make sure they're connected, let them know, whatever that process looks like. Also, make sure you have a vendor list. It, it, far too frequently, we may walk into a disaster situation as IT consultants and start asking questions. Okay, how do I contact that vendor? Now, I don't know, let me scramble to find their name and number. Um, certainly your IT consultant should have, and, and you, uh, as part of your disaster recovery plan, please, please put in there. Um, here's the phone number for, I'm just going to throw the names out there, CenturyLink. And I push two and then four to get to a human that I can actually ask questions about the internet about. Okay. Um, have that prepared ahead of time. Again, we're trying to reduce the amount of time it takes from the time we say go until the time it's completed. And then testing. So um, I, I love my fellow IT people. I'm as guilty as this as anyone. We put things in place as IT people. And if we don't test them, they may work that time, but then we may find that things changed in the last two years since we set it up. And when it came time that we needed it, it wasn't set up properly. Uh, far too often we find us with backups. Someone switched servers, someone went from QuickBooks to Sage, whatever happened, some changes occurred 
and the backups didn't address it properly. They didn't, they didn't change to go with it. So it is important that we're auditing things and testing things at least quarterly, I would say. Quarterly, take your three or four most common files that you, that you use, your Excel documents, whatever you're in, your QuickBooks company file, and go to your IT people and say, hey, I'd like you to restore that from yesterday, or I'd like you to restore that from last week. Have people test it. Um, and it's, it's painful, right? In some cases where you're testing a database, you have to go down for an hour for them to be able to test that. It, it is worth it. Please make sure you can recover. And again, because you're going through the testing phase, everyone knows what to do. When the real deal happens, everyone just goes into motion. It's habit at that point. It's trained. Everyone knows what to do. Okay. So some of the systems I'll cover here, and we, we talked about it a little earlier, right? Think about your phones. Wh what happens to the phone calls if the office goes down? How do we route them to the right people? How do we get people back on the phones if they're agents? Email is, you know, used to be kind of a nicety. Nowadays, it's pretty mission critical. How do we make sure we got email? Um, for most of these systems, there are solutions that you can do on-premise, and there are solutions you can do in the cloud. The cloud has an expense, They're, undeniably. We can't doubt that. There's an ongoing and perpetuity monthly expense for any cloud-based products. But the advantages, is, the advantages are fairly evident, right? I don't have to worry about power. I don't have to worry about the thing having proper internet. I don't have to worry about backing it up. I don't have to worry about updating it. I don't have to pay someone to manage all those things that's being handled for me. And cloud-based, when it comes to disaster, is really, really convenient. If I have Office 365 email and I'm at the office and it goes down, I just go home or I go on my phone, I fire up my email and I have access to my email again. Um, and this is true across any cloud-based uh, product. If your file storage is on a local file server at the office and it goes down, that's a different event from um, a company. For instance, I've worked with a venture capitalist firm. Every employee has a laptop and they use uh, a, a cloud-based storage system. They use, they use Box. There's plenty of them out there. There's OneDrive and Box and FileShare and, there, and there's many of them out there, but all of them designed to do the same thing, to house your files externally, securely, and then allow you to access them from anywhere. Those are really, really convenient and facilitate a disaster recovery operation. So I would encourage you to look at those. Okay, uh, websites. If your website goes down, if your internet goes down, are you hosting the web? Most people aren't these days, but some people still host their own web servers. Um, you know, if your website goes down, is that, a, is that a mission critical thing? People can't get to your site. Are they gonna start calling and yelling? Will customers go away? How critical is that? Text messages. Um, a lot of companies now, nowadays are integrating texts, right? We get texts from customers. I've, I've seen customers that use uh, SMS interfacing tools so they can reach out to their um, typically younger groups of customers and, and get information back. So if that goes down, how will you handle those? And then of course the internet, you know, right? Internet outages is a thing. Um, slow internet is a real deal these days. So how are you dealing with that? What's the plan? Okay, so restoration and rebuild. So determine your threshold for downtime, right? What What is truly tolerable for your organization? It, is a day okay? Is two days okay? Um, you know, is an hour not okay? And that's gonna determine the basis for this. That's how we start. What's mission critical? And then I would encourage you um, to look at insurance. Cyber Cybersecurity insurance is a real thing. And I have seen cases where it's been deployed and saved saved a company probably. You know, sometimes that expense, the the uh, paying the ransom and all that um, can, can get crazy high or potential lawsuits from fallout from that could get high. So uh, I would encourage you, I'm, I'm not an insurance salesman and maybe there's nothing applicable, but look at that. Is there something that insurance could help us cover and make us feel better in the event of a disaster? Okay, I think that is all I have as far as the data goes. So let's switch to the uh, Q&A portion. Gary, did we end up with any questions? I haven't seen anybody in the chat. If anybody uh, has a question, okay. post it now. Um, give you all a couple seconds. Um, Thank you all for attending. Thank you all for watching. We appreciate it. Um, and once again, we will have a recording of this webinar made available after the fact, and we will send that all out to you. Uh, and also, we have webinars that we've done over the past few weeks that we want to make you aware of, things on uh, IT considerations when working from home, how to use Microsoft Teams. Many of you may or may not be using Teams, and so there's a helpful training uh, on that. Uh, all of these things are available on our website. And of course, if you have any questions about 
remote working, getting your IT up and running, and of course, disaster recovery, please feel free to reach out. Please let us know. Uh, James, it doesn't look like we have any questions at this time, so I think we can uh, wrap it up. Thank, uh, you. Thank you all. One minute, if I may, I'll just take 30 seconds of everyone's time before we wrap up here. Uh, if you've been with me in another webinar, you'll, you'll, you've heard me say this before. Um, I just want to ask everyone to be a little understanding right now. Uh, we are all, all of us across the board, uh, slammed, overwhelmed in, in a state of uh, uncertainty, right? Um, and this is particularly true of, of IT folks right now. And I'm, yeah, I'm going to side with them for a minute. Um, we've got a lot of requests to work from home. Uh, the IT companies of the world are trying to shift everyone to, not everyone, a lot of companies to work from home environment. There's a lot of mass confusion. So I just ask that we be patient with each other. Um, now more than ever, it's time to be kind and patient, a little understanding. So that's all. Thank you very much for coming out today. And I hope everyone stays safe and healthy. Have a great day, all. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.